People who run large companies and people who write management theory books are differently wired. Not in the case of Vineet Nair, CEO of a $3.3 billion and 73,000 employee strong HCL Technologies, he's equally at home with strategy and execution. Take for example his employee first, customer second concept. An idea less confident business leaders than Vineet would not touch even from a distance. When I say employees first, people say, well, that's kind of obvious. But when I say employees first, customers second, that's when their eyes light up. When other, other people might look at a person and see someone who is, quote, ordinary, but I think Vineet sees someone who is extraordinary. A true pathbreaker, Vineet Nair actually had an unlikely start at HCL Technologies. I was very convinced that I was the wrong man for the job. Right. And uh, I, I took up the job crying and screaming because, uh, as you know my background, I'm an entrepreneur. I like speed and I don't understand large organizations. What really happens as a startup, you start with an idea mm. and a lot of people passionately align with you because of their idea. And then you're all friends and uh, you do not worry about how you do things, mm. where you do and how do you run and they just happen. And suddenly you come into an organization where you have to generate passion, uh, you have to find a purpose in life. Right. So it's, it's almost you know, doing it the other way around, which was, uh, which was my moment of truth in saying I'm the wrong man. And you really brought a completely new way of thinking to that. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, from actually the, the management point of view, like Shivnada, for instance, he completely sort of let you go out there and put into place whatever you wanted. He never questioned you. He never said, okay, what kind of radical methods are you going to employ? Do you think that's the reason he put you in charge at HCL? Because he knew you were going to completely shake it up. I, I don't know. I, I, you know I, I never dared ask him his reasons because I was afraid I'll get the wrong answer. Uh, when you try and hold on to the wheel and say that somebody else is on the wheel, you really end up destroying and having a car crash. Uh, so I think that was a very big important step one. Important step two is I think he has known me for many years mm -hmm. and the board has known me for many years and they knew that I would not do things in the ordinary way. Uh, so I would do it in a different way because I did not know it to do it any other way, let me put it that way. And plus I'm a guy who really likes to have fun. Fun is very important for me. Right. It's my life, my time. And I will do what I want to do the way I want to do it every minute of it. And I'm not, I'm not going to do things because somebody else wants me to do it. Now, employees first and customers second. Before we actually get into the specifics of, of the concept, on first uh, glance, when you, when you sort of think about it, one wonders, but employees are always supposed to be a valuable asset anyway. So what's new exactly about the concept? It's like when you say, tell your wife I love you, right? <laughs> Every day in the morning, it doesn't mean that she believes you, right? It's the same in real life. When you tell your employees I love you, and then you go to the room and take actions which are neither reflection of transparency, neither reflection of that you really believe in, mm -hmm. just saying I love you to the employees is not good enough. Okay. I was very convinced that the, what was happening in our houses where the teenagers were coming in and questioning our so-called unconditional love and saying we really don't want unconditional love, we want respect for our opinion and we want an equal stake on the table. My two teenagers wanted an equal say in the decisions which impacted their lives and our lives. And therefore, in my mind, the world was moving away from I love you to I respect you. Okay. And I think this whole thing that I love employees was losing its meaning, do I respect you, do I respect your opinion, and does it count in my decision? And I think we were missing on those three counts across the world, and that, that's what Employee First was about. You know, you've always said that leaders, uh, you know, have too much power, but in a way, um, and there are two, two parts to this question. Firstly, aren't leaders 
expected to have that power, to use it at their discretion. Don't employees kind of look up to them, want to have some kind of role model? My point was not that whether you have powers or you don't have powers. Mm -hmm. If you have powers and you give it up, you can actually cause a revolution. If you have powers and use it, you can cause a change. And, and that's just it, a revolution. How do you ensure that it does turn out to be a good revolution or for a good cause or, you know, one that contributes to change? For instance, you, you know, you were one of those, the first CEOs that actually stood up and said, I don't necessarily know everything. And, it, and it's worked brilliantly. I mean, it's actually, you know, as, as you've mentioned before, turn things around, having employees willing to contribute or help or, or you know, you know, talk to you about certain things or lead things forward or in the right direction. But how do you make sure it doesn't, you know, work in a negative manner that people don't perhaps take that extra uh, responsibility or, or leeway as such and, and use it the wrong way or don't use it? You are saying, you employee, you should trust my wisdom mm. in telling you that I'm doing things good for you and the company. Mm. But at the same time, I'm not going to trust you because I'm the CEO and you're the employee. There's something something wrong with that logic. Okay. And if you try and attempt the logic at home with teenagers, you will exactly know, you know what the employees really feel. The second aspect is, think about it this way, and it's, it's very common sense that in a relay race which you're running, if you're not going to pass the baton on to somebody, right. how is it going to run with it? If in a relay race you don't even know who has the baton, right? right? All I'm doing in life is, hey, the baton is not with me. <laughs> no, it's not with me. It's with you. Got it. So once you're, and it is true. So what can I do, right? There is, the complexity of business is so high. The technology implication of business is high. Mm -hmm. And there are verticals and all that is there. All my job is to make sure I keep on telling employees, what can I do for you? Right. And the baton is not with me. You are running the race. Well, you know, it's worked brilliantly over here, whether that's a credit to you putting that to into me. effect. None to me. But um, do you feel that it's, it's something that can be as successfully replicated? The trust between you and your employees are the lowest today, irrespective of who you are. You may be God's grace to mankind, but the trust is the lowest. Number two, the Generation Y which is coming in, find the structures, the command and control very boring very suffocating and they try and do everything to be non-productive. Number three, you want innovation to succeed and that innovation is going to come from employees who are demotivated, who don't like your company, who don't like you. <laughs> you know, boards after boards where I am going and getting to speak hmm. are talking about, Winnie, this is a problem. How do we get more from our people? And my answer to them is that this is one way you can get more by first creating a trust between you and them. Okay. Number two, handing over the baton to them. And number three, trusting them that they can run the race faster than you think you can run the race on their behalf. A large part of it, as you said, is communication, building trust. Also, outside the company, particularly after you know, the turnaround, after the five years, and, and you've seen the performance, the delivery, you know, and, and, and the actual culmination of all the, the experiments, why not even go out there more to communicate that to the outside world, so to, to enable them to understand uh, you know, what exactly has been done here at HCL? Maybe right or wrong, but I, I, am a, I, I'm a person who believes that, as I said, every minute I spend in life has to be for a purpose. And I truly believe that people, you know, what people think is least relevant for me. I have one lifetime. I want to enjoy every minute of it. I want to enjoy it with friends, families, and people I want to be with. Now, whether people understand it or don't understand it or misunderstand it or, I don't care. <laughs> so, if they want to learn something, I put a book out there. If they want me to talk to them, I go there and talk to them. But that's about it. I mean, I, I keep having fun. And that, that's just what it's all about. The CEO that stands up and says, really, it doesn't matter. I don't necessarily know everything and I definitely don't care what you think about the decisions I'm making. We're going to come back and continue our chat with him in just a moment. I, I believe in craziness. I believe in noise. I believe in chaos. I believe in fun. I believe that uh, in truth, I believe in honesty. And I believe that every day, if we are true to all these, uh, we will be a great company, which we are.
I think the reason why Vineet is an effective leader is because he cares. He cares about people who work with him and he cares about children, which his non-profit venture Sampark reaches out to. It's such concerns that make his management style distinctive and successful. He knows how to get the best out of people. How difficult apart from anything else was it to actually change mindsets? Because as you said, entering especially an organization that has already been established and set up uh, employees that are already disgruntled or, you know, been in a mold now for some time, how difficult the task was that? The first aspect is do you really want to get away from where you are today are you unhappy enough to move out okay. if you're an ant you want to be a fast ant or a fat ant or a rich ant you always will be an ant you will never be a butterfly but if you want to be a butterfly you have to be very unhappy being an ant that i'm not happy rich fat you know fast but no ant so the first step is you have to be very unhappy with your state of affairs okay and that is very difficult because most of us are actually convincing our employees that how great we are so we are not in the business of creating unhappiness we are in the business of selling them happiness with mm -hmm. knowing fully well that we are like a reeking leaking uh, building got it the second is is there an aspiration out there which is so powerful that you can be free like egypt the reason people in thousands and millions came because they had this compelling vision that i could be free so unhappiness with today a vision of tomorrow which is very compelling and then you have to provide small catalyst actions to move from here to there small actions so changing mindset is difficult and yet very easy if we understand that the mindset is one because you have not created the dissatisfaction okay so the first step which we took in hcl is showed everybody the mirror that we are the most irrelevant of all <laughs> and that for a company which was very proud for its existence and it has done some very classic work for 25 years and i've been associated it from the time it was 4 million dollars in revenue it was a very agonizing and painful thing to do but we did that and then we created a vision of tomorrow which was employee first that we would be a, the most innovative company in the world in the way how we run the company and not just what we do and then small catalyst action from here to there that changed the mindset well how many how many times did you hear beneath you must be crazy every day once <laughs> every day at least once <laughs> and i you know that's that's true because i am crazy right uh because i've decided to live my life by my standards rather than your standards right i yeah i dance with employees i, I play know, with do employees. you still do that do of you course, still do that? I, you know I, i was in sydney last week and you know we were 1500 of us dancing together so you know i i think craziness creates positive energy i i believe in craziness i believe in noise i believe in chaos i believe in fun i believe that uh, in truth i believe in honesty and i believe that every day if we are true to all these uh, we will be a great company which we are Okay there's still a few skeptics or a few critics i mean firstly there are some that say this isn't a new model it's just been recap repackaged the entire cost arbitrage you know mod model has just been repackaged how would you respond to that the question i ask is that yes what we are doing is common sense yes what we are doing may have been done by people before and yes it is working for us it could be accidentally that we are growing twice as fast as our competition my question is so what are you doing about it so as long as you copy what we have copied quote and quote okay. i'm happy so where did i say it is an original idea it works so as far as i'm concerned is do it well you've always been saying you know at some stage i'm not going to be here i'm going to move on at some stage it's going to happen as you just said you know market cap will double again will we still see vinith nayar here see vinith nayar is not defined by the boundaries of a company there now uh you know my you know before i came into it till in 2005 i started my own ngo called sampark and mm -hmm. you know launched a project called the million smiles project uh what excites me about it till is that suddenly i have 77000 people who forget the business i can use to create the million smiles and that is what my excitement is i think 
HCL as a company is running on its own steam. I, I add less value today than I ever added in the last five years. That is making an assumption that I ever added value, which which I tend to believe I did because it's the other, other yeah, aspect is very scary. This is a Jewish CEO, do you find, who says, yeah, I add a lot less value <laughs> now, you know? It, it is because, you know, the people are running their own races. Uh, they are a lot more aware of what they need to do. Uh, the, the change in HCL is irreversible and we are running faster and faster and therefore I, I need to do something else. What's also so different about HCL is the fact that, you know, you all here seem to recognize the importance of CSR or giving back to society in your own way. You with some perk, we've seen Shivnadar also, you know, very active in the field. Again, why is that or what, what is it about HCL that brings that out? I think what's common between me and Shiv, uh, you know, it's very difficult to compare me with Shiv. I mean, he's a, <laughs> he's a giant in his own right, is that we come from small towns. Uh, we lost our member of the family early in life. Uh, we, have, we have actually seen what all these superficial relationships mean. Okay. And we've also seen how society comes together and how a village comes together to support you. And the fact that you would not be where you are had it not been for a lot of people who supported you, who you would not imagine would, would ever support you. And in today's world, this whole objective towards profit is good, but I think the being socially responsible is very important. You, you can't do business in U.S. where there is 10% employment and not be in the business of generating employment in the U.S. To me, it's unacceptable. Uh, same is true in India. You can't be in the business of uh, n not just by just saying that you're creating employment, you're doing good for social cause. You are not. It is, it is important from my point of view that you are part of the solution for every ill which surrounds you. It's not about giving back because what's very important is you give back because you feel good about it. So it's a very selfish objective. If you were not feeling good about giving back, I can right. trust you, I, you know, nobody will do it. The only thing is, not many people have tried to give it. Hmm. If they get addicted to giving back, it is more satisfying than anything else in life. So all we have to try and do, which is what we are attempting to do this year in HCL, is a massive campaign to try and figure out how 77,000 people can give back and get addicted to that, and that would be a big change. Well, while we actually uh, soak in some of that, uh, some very important words uh, there coming in from beneath, let's take a very quick break, but when we return, we're actually going to take you right inside the Kiran Nadar Museum of Art. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Vinny, what the hell are you doing? And I know I was very small at that time. I, I, I looked up at her and saying, strike. <laughs> I think it's not a coincidence that the sprawling HCL campus in Noida houses this rich art collection. After spending some time in the Kiran Nadar Museum of Art with Vineet, I understood that in order to appreciate art, one must learn to look at the details as well as the bigger picture. And as Vineet started talking about the bigger issues surrounding the Indian IT industry, it became clear that he's a true connoisseur of both art and ideas. You've been talking a lot also of late about uh, India's competitiveness in the global arena. You yourself in your travels and interactions and talks have also been experiencing interacting with a lot of people globally. How do you feel we can actually get up there and... Uh... I, un unfortunately, very few people are asking the question you're asking. We, we must understand that India is part of a global landscape which is without geographies. The developed world with very little domestic consumption is going to come very aggressively on the emerging markets like India. And therefore we will, with billion people, becoming this huge opportunity for high consumption. If we do not focus on competitiveness in the global market and focus on how can we increase exports, we will become an in-basket Africa case. We have to focus on competitiveness. The competitiveness will come from skills, right? Is our skills competitive or not? Is the investment in skills competitive or not? Is investment in infrastructure competitive or not? And is the government promoting mm. or not promoting the development of various industries like IT? I truly believe that the Indian IT industry is an example of good government decision of building a $50 billion industry with huge amount of employment because they gave tax breaks 
and make Made India very competitive on the global market. By withdrawing those tax breaks, the whole BPO industry moved to Philippines because we became globally incompetitive. Uh, and then you will see the advent of China also coming in. Right. So I believe that more and more governments should think about global competitiveness, industry by industry, and whenever they are taking decisions on incentives, tax, infrastructure, they have to take it from that point of view. And unfortunately, I believe India is becoming less competitive with each passing year than more competitive. What are the key, you know, aspects or pieces of advice that you would give to somebody who was looking at perhaps going out there and trying to bring about a process of change in their company? So first is I'm the wrong person to give anybody advice because it's always dangerous. Or from your experiences. <laughs> I, would, I would say imagine that you are in, a, in deserts of Rajasthan mm. and it's, it's, it's mid-afternoon at 12 o'clock and you have 500 people who are with you. And most probably, because you can't see anything on east, west, north, south, everybody is in a brown in motion, completely lost about what they need to do. And when you ask yourself, your heart tells you that even you don't know what needs to be done. Right. So one part of you will say, just be and just look around and wait for somebody else to start walking in a certain direction. Right. The other part, which I hope will tell you, is that you, you, put, you take a flagpole, put it out there and saying, we are going east, or we're going this way. What would happen is, number one, you have taken the first step. The Brownian motion which, will hap which was happening with Sunday collapse, people will either walk with you or walk against you. But you have suddenly given direction, and that is leadership. So if you really intrinsically want to bring about a change, start with, start with setting a direction, setting yourself up for failure without knowing if that is the right direction. Some will go with you, some will not. And in the process of going from point A to point B, you will discover the right place to go. You've always, always said exactly what you think and never worried. One little story that you were telling me about uh, yourself in school, if you could tell us that again. So I, you know, I was this, uh, this little boy who, who truly believed that compliance with teachers and you know, living up to their standards was not my cup of tea. And this one teacher you know, was not very happy with our class. And I believe that what she was doing was not good for our confidence and not being fair. And in my mind, being honest and fair are two very important ingredients for which I will do anything to fight. Mm. And this was class nine in school, and I took the bunch of boys and girls in the class and we declared strike. And this is the first time you know, it happened in the school. And I had an American principal, uh, Sister Laurette, which I was very fond of her. And uh, she was six feet, six inches, was very tall. <laughs> And she walked in and looked down at me like that. Vinit, what the hell are you doing? And I know I was very small at that time. I, I, I looked up at her and saying, strike. <laughs> and we all walked out of the school. And we stayed out for seven days before she agreed to bring us in. Seven days. Yeah, seven days we were sitting in the lawns. She would not allow us to come back to the school. And um, we refused to go into the teacher's class because we thought she was not being fair in what she was doing. So that was my my first journey of <laughs> things not to do. <laughs> Set the tone onwards. Set the tone, yes. Vinny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's been so an absolute much. pleasure having thank you on the you. show. Thank you.